So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lena Kirkotis. Uh, she, she's actually, I guess you're kind of a, like a Cornell lifer, right? Uh, you, 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 <laughs> you got your- Not quite. Not, well, not yet, I guess, but you, know, <laughs> but you, you, you got your PhD there, right? That's and then, uh, And then she was a Humboldt fellow and did, uh, where she did cryo-electron microscopy uh, uh, in Germany at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular uh, Structural Biology. Then, uh, you know, she came back to, to Cornell for, for her postdoc. Um, uh, and then she was so good they didn't let her leave, um, and now she's a professor there. Um, uh, she's won, you know, all, all of the awards basically. So she 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 uh, she, she's got you know. Uh, just like you, just like you. Uh, well, you got you know, the presidential early career. Now I forget. Did you get it in time to meet Obama? Or, or yes, I did. Uh, so, I so did. She, she won it just when it time. still meant something. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, and and then. Uh, no, 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 no. The money is always good. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, and, and she, she's also gotten the career award, but, we're, we're, uh, but um, the, I, I came to know her through the, the Packard Fellowship, um, and for those of you, these meetings are really nice, because it's a very broad set of people, not just physics, but all areas, and, uh, and so you really hear a wide variety of talks, and every, and every year I go, and, and I'm blown away, like, I mean, they're all good talks, of course, because these are all great people, but there's always, you know, one or two talks that really blow me away, and I remember very vividly that now, Lena's talk just, you know, I was just completely amazed, both by, I mean, I, I'm sure you'll see, like, many absolutely beautiful pictures, um, but, and, and that was great, of course, I love seeing Adams, but, but really, you know, what, uh, you know, what she was able to, you know, kind of the physics that she was able to, to bring out of these pictures was, was just really amazing. And so, um, it, it touches on a lot of different areas, so, I mean, you can see that today she'll be talking about two very different areas, um, and so it's just a, it's just a really wonderful thing, and, and I'm, uh, I, I'll stop saying anything. She, she will do it much better. <laughs> thank you very much for this introduction. And in fact, oh, um, in fact, usually you already did the service that I wanted to do today, which is that um, if you take anything out of the way this uh, out of this talk away, it is that microscopy is not just taking pretty pictures, but that we can actually get at the underlying physics of the systems. So uh, I think that's really important. And uh, I'm part of the applied and physics department at Cornell. Uh, and therefore very interested in underlying physics of both uh, quantum systems or electronic materials. Um, and then much more on the applied side, thinking about how we understand uh, interfaces between liquids and solids, and in particular, important interfaces that in a rechargeable battery, um, uh, that where dendrites form can span from one electrode to the other, short that battery, and you get thermal runaway and fire. And so what we study in this system is understanding the processes that occur at the interface be between the liquid and the solid. And the reason really why we can do that is because we have taken electron microscopy uh, from being operated at room temperature to being operated at low uh, cryogenic temperature. And some of you might know that, this, that is nothing, nothing really new because the Nobel Prize in chemistry, I believe, was given out to cryo-electron microscopy. But it was really primarily used for biological sample. And see, here I take some of the ideas that I developed during my postdoc in the bio lab on understanding liquid-solid interface. So this is on the one extreme. Before I get to batteries, I want to talk about uh, understanding electronic phases um, really at the atomic scale. And, and for that, I want to show you how cryo uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy allows you to understand local uh, distortion in the atomic lattice. Okay, so what you see, these stripes, is actually the stripe phase of a manganite. And what we are plotting is the displacement of an atom column, column in, the, in the stripe charge order phase. And you see the, uh, the distortion are on the order of picometers. So we need a, need a technique that can, uh, can measure at very high precision single atomic columns that let you extract those modulation at relevant temperature where phases exist. And so that wa that's what we have done with, uh, with our cryo stem technique. So some of the, the, usually my first introduction is that uh, electron microscopy is very powerful. Most of you might know how it works. I wanna just, for those of you who don't, uh, this is typically how we operate it. We focus a very uh, uh, high energy electron beam down uh, to subatomic length scales on the sample. Okay, so uh, converge down on the sample. That electron will interact then with the, uh, with the atoms and electrons in the material. 
uh, we have elastic scattering to uh, a certain angular distribution, and we can collect those elastically scattered electrons. And what does that give us? It gives an, an elastic signal of the structure. And so for a long time, electron microscopy has produced images that let you look at uh, the atomic structure and quality of hetero interfaces here, for example, between two complex oxides. Uh, and you see, for example, here this uh, reconstruction at the interface. Um, if you uh, notice that in this particular case, this annular detector collects a certain angular range uh, of electrons. And if you go to very high angles, you're very sensitive to atomic numbers. That's why you see this bright, dark contrast from the top to the bottom. Now imagine that we change the detector angle to go to much smaller detector angle. So we either make the detector smaller or we place it further away from, from this, uh, sorry, closer, closer to, the, to the sample. When you do that, you can actually be not only sensitive to the atomic columns that are actually heavy, so high, uh, high atomic number elements, but also the oxygens. So notice this is the ideal perovskite structure we have heavy cations at the, uh, at the corners and at the center. So that's the B cation. This is the A side cation. And then we have an octa uh, oxygen octahedra that uh, surrounds that transition metal in the center. Um, now, a lot of the physics, and I had beautiful discussion this morning about octahedral rotation. And so ideally, if you want to understand how materials uh, perform, you want to be able to identify the location of cations, but also of the oxygens in the sample. And so by going to low detector angles, this is what we call in the bright field imaging, we can, we are not only sensitive to, to heavy cations, but also to the oxygen atoms in the sample, and we can extract rotations and tilts uh, across an interface. So this is very powerful, it's very informative as we start designing new quantum systems uh, where we combine certain, uh, certain oxides with others or 2D materials with oxides. Um, but we want to do more, we want to be quantitative and want to be able to extract local properties. And in order to do that, uh, we want to measure with high precision uh, the <coughs> lattice, lattice order parameters, for example. And so what we can do today, and this is basically uh, borrowing uh, super resolution techniques from optics, um, imagine the resolution of today's microscopes is about half an angstrom. But in order to look at distortions on the picometer scale, we need to localize an atom to much higher precision than the resolution of the microscope. And we can do that by taking a high signal to noise image, then fitting each uh, atomic column with a Gaussian or the model that you choose, and identifying the location of that atom with high precision. We can do that to a few picometers here. You see the strontium to strontium. This is strontium titanate, one of our favorite test objects because you can put lots of electrons on it. Um, but this is just a test object, and what you can see is that the spatial extent of the strontium to strontium separation is just about two picometers. And that means we now can, with two, meter, uh, two, meter, uh, two picometer precision, localize our atoms in the sample and across interfaces if we want to do so. You can go further. If you, for example, look at very small, uh, small scale images, um, and in particular samples, you can actually push this further down to sub-picometer. This is work by uh, our colleague, uh, Paul Voyes, uh, who has shown in silicon, you can actually go down to sub-picometer uh, precision. In our case, we want to get to very long li length scales in order to look at nanoscale inhomogeneities over tens of nanometers, and that means we are a little bit more limited. Okay. So why is it important to extract uh, positions of atoms at, or uh, let me precise, uh, be precise, it's a column of atoms. We're looking at projections. Why is it important to extract this? So one system that is usually very intuitive to think about is if you take our perovskite oxide and displace the transition metal along one axis, you can get polar displacement in the material. And if we can extract this polar displacement, that gives us uh, uh, one uh, order parameter that couples directly to the physical properties of the material. And that's what they have done here, where they have mapped the position of the, uh, the A side cation, these are the bright ones, and the B side cations in the middle, and mapped out polar uh, displacement and how they vary across domains. Okay? And this is a local probe, uh, uh, which is quite interesting. What can we do with this? 
Here's an example from uh, the group of Ramesh, who has uh, demonstrated that by measuring the position of each atom and extracting the polar displacement, you can actually discover uh, uh, polar displacement vortices, this vortex anti-vortex pair in uh, strontium titanate, lead titanate uh, super lattice. So you discover new phases uh, uh, by being able to actually track atoms at that scale. Um, and an example from, from Cornell, uh, we can also look at uh, a different, uh, different system. I don't want to go too much into the details, but here we are also looking at the uh, ferroelectric polarization of the material. And what's interesting to note, not only can we extract the polar displacement, you see this is from 60 to uh, negative 60 picometers, but we can also convert that directly in polarization. And that means you have a local measure of the polarization in the super lattice. You see that we have a polarization vector pointing downwards at the upper part of the super lattice and upwards in the lower part. So we can measure uh, uh, order parameters with, with, uh, with high resolution. Okay, so this is elastic imaging. Uh, very powerful, and I'll show you an example in a minute how we apply this. But in addition to elastic scattering, the electron, as it interacts with the material, will also undergo inelastic scattering. Uh, and in our inelastic scattering process, uh, we're going to excite uh, or we're going to generate uh, or the electron will lose energy to those excitations of the material, whether it's optical excitation or whether it's ionization uh, uh, excitations, which is similar to our, uh, what you might know as XAS. And here this is called EOS, with the, uh, which is the uh, electron analogous uh, picture. So these inelastic scattered electrons will undergo an energy loss uh, uh, and we can disperse that using a spectrometer and measure uh, the number of electrons as a function of energy loss. And that's what you see right away here. We can extract titanium, oxygen, and lanthanum. This is a lanthanum titanate sample. And what's important is that the, the area under the curve uh, correlates with the concentration of the material. But much more interesting is that the fine structure, the exact shape of that peak, will tell us how the bonding varies in the material. So what is uh, how does hybridization affect it? What is the formal valence of our material? So one example is that of titanate. So here is lanthanum titanate compared to, sorry, lanthanum titanate compared to strontium titanate where the formal valence changes from three plus to four plus. And what we are mapping is the, the titanium L23 edge. Okay? And so what you see right away that the fine structure of that edge dramatically changes and it turns out for these transition metal oxides where hybridization is less important and ionic, the ionic uh, picture dominates, we can use these fingerprints to track uh, the formal valence as you go into any point uh, on the sample. Just a quick reality check. Here is uh, a comparison of strontium titanate with europium titanate and the spectra look almost identical and this work has been, uh, has been done for many years now. Here's one example of this. So EOS can be used uh, to track changes in bonding. In this particular uh, case, it's a variation in, in uh, uh, valence states of the material. And so what you now imagine, if you combine, uh, combine an atomic resolution probe with spectroscopy, you can position your probe at the top, record a spectrum in that point, and scan across the interface and measure how the electronic states vary as you go uh, through a well-defined interface. Now, uh, now, what has happened in the last decade or uh, 15 years or so, um, we have, or the community has uh, produced a first commercial uh, aberration correctors, which correct aberrations of the uh, 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 electron lens. And that means we can not only uh, um, measure in line mode, but we can now imagine uh, scan, instead of just taking an elastic image, simultaneously recording a full spectrum at each point in the image. So imagine you scan your beam across and at each point you co uh, collect the elastic signal and the inelastic signal with very high efficiency. And that allows, allows us to go to, uh, to extract chemical maps. So where do, we cannot only say where the atom sits uh, or where atoms sit, but also which atom is sitting where. So here 
is this image decomposed into lanthanum, titanium, manganese. You see a purple line which tells you there's some intermixing between titanium and manganese. Um, so this is really nice. Uh, it tells some of the physics. We are really interested in bonding variations. So while I will not talk about the details, but today the precision of our measurements is so that we can extract extremely small variations in charge. And so here we have looked at a manganite grown on top of a strontium titanate. Uh, and in this case, when you measure the charge distribution across this interface, you see an accumulation of charge right at that interface. Uh, and when you look carefully, the, um, uh, the, the maximum number of, of electrons uh, in this layer is, is about a fraction of, uh, of an electron, so 0.1 electrons. Yes, question, I love that. Yeah, so, uh, so if you want to get uh, really good spectroscopy, you need to be within 50 nanometers or so. Uh, there's plenty of work that goes to 30 nanometers. We can certainly look uh, and get beautiful atomic resolution images at that. Uh, but in spectroscopy, you're much more sensitive to be, uh, beam um, tails. And as you go to thicker samples, you get beam, beam broadening. And that will affect uh, how, how, um, how the signal will vary across the interface. And so be, you need to be really careful in, in uh, deciphering what is beam effect and what's actually a sample effect. So our samples, short answer, is about 10 to 15, may, I mean, not more than 20 nanometers. And we can measure that very accurately uh, by looking at the uh, diffraction pattern. Okay. Uh, if there are questions, feel free. That, I like that, actually. I'm happy to stop at any point, and we can just discuss. OK. So now. Uh, this is a phase diagram of a manganite. And I don't want to go to the, through the phases that exist in the system. Here you see actually, uh, as you dope the system, there are lots of phases that emerge. Um, the problem in this picture for microscopists is that this is where room temperature is. And now you will say that I carefully selected the phase diagram, which I did, uh, because most of the interesting phases are sitting right b below this point. All the work that I've shown you so far was done at room temperature. And the reason why we've performed all these measurements at room temperature is because getting stable imaging and spa stable spectroscopy at, uh, let's say, liquid nitrogen uh, temperature is very, very difficult. And people have tried, uh, but atomic resolution uh, that allows you to measure with high precision has not been obtained before. So what I have set out to do with my group in the last few years is actually pushing this, well, I mean, I had more uh, bigger hopes of being able to go continuously from room temperature to liquid nitrogen. Um, I think that will take me another five years, but right now I'm in liquid nitrogen temperature where we can measure with ultra high precision, so two picometers or so, uh, the position of atoms, and we have made progress in spectroscopy as well. So if we can actually do this, what are the opportunities? Uh, uh, I already showed you we can extract structural order parameters and we can look, map charge distribution in the sample. Systems that you might imagine looking at is electronic states at low temperature. For example, I will show you an example of charge ordered phases in manganese, where we extract the lattice component. Uh, another topic that we might approach in the future is high temperature superconductivity. Liquid nitrogen will just get us there. Um, of, of course, long term, you might want to push further down to get uh, to, get to more exotic uh, systems. Um, but also being able to uh, traverse phase transition and carefully see how the system reacts microscopically would be important. So STEM and ES are really powerful in extracting spatial correlations, uh, inhomogeneities across nanometers uh, to hundreds of nanometers, uh, and we hope to be able to do this, uh, to measure actually the temperature dependence. So what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is uh, charge ordered phases or char charge density waves, and I want to just introduce it with a very, very simple system and just toy picture, which is not quite accurate. Um, so these are my warnings. I <laughs> so this is 1T tantum disulfide. It's an exfoliatable material. Some of you might work with this. The blue atoms are tantalum atoms. And now I want you to imagine that we have a charge density that is distributed uh, where orange corresp uh, correspond to, corresponds to maximum in the charge density. So if you have this charge distribution, you might imagine that atoms can respond to this charge. And in this particular case, they do. Here's a simulation how you would uh, imagine this doing. And you see atoms moving towards the center. Uh, and uh, um, 
This, this picture shows the formation of these stars of uh, David's, which shows you this, uh, this uh, symmetry breaking of the crystal and the charge density we've emerged. Uh, in these charge density, we've coupled very strongly with PIDs or periodic lattice distortions. In the stem, as a probe to measure position of atoms, we can get directly to the lattice part of this. Okay? So the charge is a different story. That's when we need to use ears. For now, I want to talk about uh, mapping the structural uh, order parameter. So historically, the way it's been done, or an easy way of tracking it, is using diffraction uh, techniques or reciprocal space measurement. And so I've boosted up the contrast dramatically here. Uh, these are black spots of the crystal. But what you see throughout the diffraction pattern is these small peaks. And these small peaks are due to the superstructure uh, that shows you the symmetry breaking and the additional order in the system as the material goes from uh, into a charge or that state or charge density wave state. So why are we interested in this? The reason why you're interested in charge density wave is one, uh, they couple very strongly to electronic properties. For superconductors, for example, it's been shown that charge density wave order competes with superconductivity. So understanding that uh, would be certainly of interest and there's lots of effort in doing so. Just as an example of how charge density waves uh, correlate with electronic properties. Here is, uh, this is actually bulk uh, 1T tantalum disulfide, a thick, a thick flag, uh, as it goes through a nearly commensurate to a commensurate charge density wave system, you see the jump in resistivity. Okay? Um, and uh, what we've done actually in this work, we have actually thinned it down and, uh, to understand um, at what point does this picture break down. But I won't, don't want to talk about this. Now, uh, diffraction is powerful because these super lattice peaks, these dim peaks right in the center, the, the bright ones are the black peaks, uh, encode the order of that superstructure. And what you see right away, oh, you can't. Okay, so I've added actually these small little triangles, uh, which you cannot see. Uh, uh, you will see that the peaks will change positions when you go, go to this commensurate state, but not only does these, do these three peaks change, but you also get additional peaks due to that new uh, phase that the system is in. So diffraction is certainly very interesting and for, uh, certainly very uh, important in mapping phase transitions, but a real, sp uh, real space picture uh, is uh, similarly important because as you imagine grain boundaries or domains in a material, you want to actually understand how, uh, how these phases transition from one to the other. So we really want to be able to uh, measure those properties locally. Um, our first attempt was using a microscope without aberration correction just to demonstrate we are actually sensitive to those lattice distortions. And so what this picture is, it's actually a thick sample, 25 layers, so that's quite thick. Uh, but in this case, this is for, was our first experiment in liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, we already see a super lattice structure. These are the dark spots. The tiny spots, these, this, uh, those are the atomic columns, but the dark spots encode exactly this, uh, uh, this commensurate straight in one uh, tantalum disulfide. So yes, we are sensitive to it, but we cannot extract quantitative numbers for that. In order to do this, we need to go to aberration corrected tools, and uh, I'll show you where we have come with this in a minute. So the system I want to talk about uh, uh, primarily are manganites. The reason why we pick manganites is because they have very strong ordering. Uh, here's a diffraction pattern of our system. It's a uh, BSCMO. Um, these, this is a black spot, and you see that the black spot is decorated with these super lattices, super lattice spots, similar to what you've seen before in uh, tantalum disulfide. You notice that there's not only one pair, but also an orthogonal pair, which tells you there's coexistence of two orthogonal peri periodic lattice distortions. And from the location of that peak, you can tell what the, uh, the lattice unit is. It's about the third. Okay, so we are not the first one uh, to look at this. Uh, there's been work uh, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, uh, also using cryo uh, uh, microscopy where they've used the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, diffraction pattern and image only with those electrons that come from the super lattice reflections. And that led to the picture of uh, stripes. So 
here is lanthanum calcium manganide in stripe order that, it, that was observed using these reflections, which uh, many questions arose. One, where the contrast comes from. Uh, the picture that you uh, typically draw is that of charge disproportionation. So you have uh, manganese atoms. Here's a simple picture in a different system. We have your manganese 4 plus, 3 plus ordering uh, uh, in this charge dis disproportionation picture. Now, in 2009, we have already measured, seven, excuse me, uh, we have used EARS to measure uh, upper bounds to the charge variation in the system. So here you see slight indication of stripes. This is room temperature ordering. And when you measure your EARS spectrum, so this is the energy axis, this is a manganese edge, you see that there's no positional changes within the error bar uh, as you go across one of the, or several of these stripes. So we've put upper bounds in how much the charge could actually vary, and it was for percentages. So uh, certainly, the amount of charge involved in this picture is very small, so the question then arises, uh, uh, what does the lattice do? Okay, so, uh, so here's now what we have done. This is uh, a manganite that we've selected because the phase transition is right above room temperature. And that is really good because we can first assess uh, how order occurs near the transition temperature and then far away uh, as we cool. So this is the atomic structure image in the scanning trans transmission electron microscope. Uh, it already includes local distortions. The way we know that uh, is by taking a Fourier transform of a real space image, you again su see the super lattice modulation that decorate our Bragg spot. Okay? Um, now the advantage of Fourier transforms compared to diffraction patterns is that a Fourier transform is typically a very small area. So here, maybe 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 50 nanometers or so in standard diffraction imaging. Uh, and that tells you that over 10 to 50 nanometers, you already have these two order orthogonal order parameters, uh, one in this direction, one in the uh, orthogonal direction. The other advantage is not only you measure relatively local, but you also have both phase and amplitude of the modulation. Okay? And that will become important in a minute. All right. So now, uh, what we have done. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the detail. How we have done it is we have actually extracted how the, uh, um, now with atomic uh, uh, peak fitting, we can actually extract how an atom is displaced with respect to the original position in the charge density wave state. And so what the, the picture that emerges now, we have our stripes. Okay, that's the slide I had on the, uh, in the beginning. Uh, and you see the atoms in blue are displaced downwards by about five, six, seven, eight picometers, depending. Um, notice also they trans uh, the uh, distort transfers to the, display uh, to the uh, order vector. So this is the order vector. This is your stripes. That's where your charge modulation occurs. But instead of going towards the charge, it goes transverse. Okay, that tells you bonding is important. Um, and so the ones in yellow, uh, go upward. Okay, so here is this lattice displacement. It has an amplitude term, how strong the modulation is. It has the periodicity Q, that's the, that's the Q vector, and it has a phase term. Phase term will be important as we go along, and we want to extract that uh, uh, quantitatively. Okay, so now remember, I showed you two sets of peaks, uh, two orthogonal sets of peaks. The question is, if you go to the local scale, do we still see both order, order parameters? And so that's what we, this is, the, uh, this is the picture you have for Q1, that's the order parameter in the right direction to the right. But when you extract the modulation in Q2, with this, which is orthogonal, it, it's strongly suppressed. So the picture that arises is that of local stripe order compared to this overlapping check, checkerboard pattern. Now, you might say, and it's a very valid concern, we are showing here a field of view, let's say five nanometers. What happens as you go to a larger length scales? And we already know, if you take a Fourier transform over about 10 nanometers or 20 nanometers, we see both modulations. So, um, as you go now to a larger field of view, again, you need to make sure that the imaging is stable, we can uh, extract again both modulation um, 
again on the picometer scale. And now what uh, the, the picture that arises now indeed, uh, we do have locus stripe, but we, we also have uh, disorder. So instead of having homogeneous stripes, the stripes are heterogeneous with local defects. And what's very interesting, it seems that there's a, local, uh, there's a competition between these two order parameters. And the way you see that is by showing the amplitude term. So this is the amplitude of the, uh, the blue-yellow stripes. This is the amplitude of the red-green stripes. And so let's focus just on the center area. You see that uh, Q, the Q1 order is suppressed and the Q2 order is increasing. You see that also here by green and red coming up. And so that shows you that there's some, uh, some type of comp uh, competition. OK, so I want to uh, focus for a minute on these two specific areas and want to uh, understand what the disorder is in, uh, that is involved in this. And so from this picture of the domain boundary, we can look specifically only at Q1, one of the order parameters. And what you see, if you now carefully look, there is an additional stripe that starts here. Uh, so uh, that picture is that of a dislocation um, or a topological defect, if you prefer. And the way you see that is by extracting the phase of the modulation. And the phase now shows a two pi phase wrap as you go around this topological defect. Now what's important to realize is that topological defect or dislocation is only in the modulation field. The crystal lattice is clean. There are no actual crystal, uh, crystal defects. By the way, the modulation you see is due to doping. So the second, uh, the second area that I pointed out uh, is that where the second phase came up, so that the red-green stripes, if we again pull out Q1, if you look carefully, you see that the left stripe is straight and the right one shears. So instead of having uh, uh, ordered stripes, you get shear modulation. We can extract the strain field, and you see strain right in this area. So the picture that arises is that uh, we have local stripe order, but we have defects, face defects, that decorate kind of the, uh, uh, the material. OK, so now what I promised actually in my motivation to do to show you why cry is important. And the question that I want to ask is, what happens when you go from near TC to very low temperature uh, into a more well-ordered state? OK, so the reason why it's difficult is this, that, uh, that when you cool a system in the microscope, the space you have is very small, and that means Efficient cooling is difficult, and you, are, uh, you often suffer from uh, drifts, very strong drifts and instabilities of the stage. And so we have figured out a way of compensating for that. And the way we do that is in image processing. And so it's a combination of an acquisition scheme that involves very, very rapid acquisition um, so that the signal to noise ends up being very low. But by designing a correlation method that lets you actually correlate very low signal-to-noise data. You can get a registered image with very high precision, uh, very high signal-to-noise, sufficient to now extract the position of an atom with picometer scale uh, resolution, sorry, precision. The resolution is sitting at about 0.7 angstrom. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, very important because that now lets us apply the techniques we have developed at room temperature um, to low temperature. Okay. So we are also not the first one who have looked at cooling. Lots of experiment, uh, experiments have looked at cooling, and especially those that average over uh, either uh, tens of nanometers, microns, or bulk samples. And so in diffraction, you can do this already. Uh, remember, this is a diffraction part. And what I want you to, uh, what I want to point out, we're going to look at these spots now, and we want to see how those spots that encode our ordering change as you cool. So this spot now is, uh, is this is in case space, right? This is at room temperature. Um, it has a certain K value and it ha has a certain height. Now what happens as you cool, you see two uh, effect, effects. One, sharpening and strengthening of the peak that tells you there's stronger long range correlation. But also you see a shift in the position of the peak. And what that tells you is that the wave vector shifts up on cooling. Okay? 
So the question now that, uh, that we ask is, what is the nature of this incommensurate uh, order as, as you heat the sample? And even at liquid nitrogen temperature, we are not, not, still not quite at uh, a third. Okay, so first we can do our local probe, and it turns out, contrary to this picture which shows you a change in K in spacing, the local order is identical. We have, as far as we can tell within the error, uh, there's a three unit cell periodicity at both temperature. Okay, so how does this picture, uh, uh, how can you reconcile this local picture with the global picture of the uh, diffraction? And the answer certainly is that at larger length scales, we have phase disorder. So here's the picture over uh, maybe 30 nanometers where we can apply the same methods to extract the displacement field. And we have, uh, we have quantitatively extracted the phase now. And here, this is one example where you have our phase wrap of 2 pi. This is a topological defect. And these are examples of shear disorder. Same things that I showed you at higher, higher mag earlier on. Now, so at room temperature, you have lots of phase disorder. When you cool, you see much improved phase correlation, much flatter phase field. And that picture of uh, stronger coherence in the phase is consistent with the shift that we observe in the K vector because a gradient in the phase will result, uh, if, it, if the gradient of the phase is non-zero, you, uh, you get a shift in K. So what we believe uh, happens that the incommensuration that you see in diffraction reflect changes in the phase configuration of your, of your sample. So all local displacements. Okay, so, um, so uh, what I showed you in the Mengen is really an example of being able to measure uh, local, uh, local lattice parameters both at room temperature and cryogenic temperature and trying to understand the nature of the, the lattice response in charge ordered phases. And there's certainly there are lots of prospects uh, that we're trying to pursue both in mapping other phases at low temperature, uh, but also improving our measuring, measurement technique to be able to tune across a phase transition carefully. And that requires much more work. So uh, this is where we are in imaging. Now the question certainly is for charge ordered system, can we map charge? Can we map bonding? And being able to map bonding requires spectroscopy. And in spectroscopy, things become much harder because this issue of drift is hard to compensate uh, in this case, or much more difficult to compensate. So uh, what we have done is we have uh, also improved uh, um, um, our detection scheme. So instead of uh, improving the holders, which is difficult and we are working on, here we're using improved detection by detecting electrons directly. So these are direct electron detectors that have been traditionally used in cryo-electron microscopy for biology. We have now enabled this for spectroscopy, and that has allowed us now to record spectroscopic maps at low temperature, and will allow us also to look at charge uh, order effects um, as you go through phase transitions. Okay, so uh, the first example was, uh, was uh, exotic or low temperature phases. Second one, a much more applied one, so we're, I'm gonna switch topics, is that Traditionally, cryo-electron microscopy has been used for biology to stabilize a biological sample because otherwise, hydrated samples dehydrate in the vacuum of the microscope. Uh, so imagine now, we can take systems in material science, in physics, uh, for example, energy conversion and storage systems uh, or biomineralizations that also suffer from similar preservation issues in the microscope. So structures that previously could not be analyzed in the microscope. So here we wanna use uh, cryo-electron microscopy to stabilize a liquid solid interface and understand how reactions uh, occur and limit performance of lithium batteries. So this is a phase diagram of water, uh, temperature, uh, pressure, and uh, this is where we wanna be in order to image liquids or hydrated samples. Traditionally, if you load uh, a liquid or a hydrated sample in a traditional microscope, you, uh, uh, you have a phase transition into the gas phase and your biologic stru structure dehydrates and collapses. Okay. So instead, what we do, we, uh, and, and lots of biologists have done for many years, we cool rapidly, we load it into the cryo-electron microsco uh, mi microscope at liquid nitrogen temperature, and we can now stabilize that liquid phase. 
Um, now, this works really well for very thin samples. So for example, proteins, right? And that's why this hype about cryo-electron microscopy, they have reached 2.1 angstrom in understanding the, uh, the structure of a protein, uh, which was uh, celebrated as a breakthrough. Now, in band arrays, we have extended objects. So how do we access buried liquid solid interfaces? Uh, one simple way of doing that is using a focus ion beam mill, uh, uh, which is basically you focus uh, uh, an ion beam and use that ion beam to machine your sample and create cross section through that sample while maintaining the, sam the sample at cryogenic temperature. So we, uh, uh, we combine a cryogenic stage with a focused ion beam and that lets us cut, uh, lets us cut through uh, liquid solid interfaces. So in this particular case, it's work we are doing with Jochen Mannert at the MPI in uh, Stuttgart, who is envisioning field effect transistors with integrated liquids. And um, there's been quite a bit of work in the condensed matter uh, field using ionic gating for, uh, for doping of systems. Here you can, they have created integrated structures that include liquids. So imagine your phone might include liquids at some point. Uh, but in, in, in any case, I want to just demonstrate we can create cross-section, we can get, get pictures of the chemical distribution across these liquid solid interfaces. So down here is an oxide, and right here is an aqueous phase. So you immediately see the impact that you could have for, for batteries. That's where all the processes that destroy your lithium metal batteries happen. And uh, certainly that's what we've tried to understand. And uh, so here we have looked at actual coin cells, coin cells that you would put in devices that we cycle understanding co uh, uh, operating conditions. It's a symmetric cell. Uh, and we have uh, ran the battery so that dendrites, these metal fingers actually form by using cryofib milling, we can create cross-section through dendrites. And what we find is two types of dendrite that have a uh, very different structure. You see one is much uh, bigger. The other one has a smaller footprint and uh, winds through the electrolyte. What's important to note is that the cross, sorry, the base of the uh, dendrite is extremely narrow. And that is, becomes really important because as you cycle and charge and discharge, some of that lithium can actually break off when, it, uh, when it's not stable enough. And we believe that actually this type 2 dendrite leads to dead lith uh, lithium during cycling. Now, these are very different in structure. What is different in their chemistry? And in order to do that, we actually need to get higher resolution information and chemistry that we can get from ears. So as we talked about, thickness of a sample is a huge concern. We need to get very thin lamellas. And the way we do that, this is our focused ion beam. This is the beam of gallium ions. We have an electron beam that images the material at the same time. Uh, but what's new here is that the, the needle that allows you to extract the small lamella is now cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. And that means in this process, so you remove material from the left and the right, create a lamella of our liquid solid interface. You attach the cold needle with uh, um, uh, water vapor, and you can extract it while maintaining it at liquid nitrogen temperature or at least below the vitrification point. So that's the transition between a gla uh, glassy and a crystalline state. Okay, so main take home message, we can create very thin lamellas while maintaining the uh, frozen state. We then load it into the electron microscope. This is a difficult process, but uh, we can certainly do th so and can image your structure at high resolution. Here's uh, actually two examples. It's a hydrogel with nanoparticles incorporated or grown in the hydrogel. Turns out when you grow nanoparticles in hydrogels, the surface structure or crystalline structure can be actually quite different. Um, just as an example, if they are soft like hydrogels, usually the samples are thicker, maybe on the order of 100 nanometers. If you have a hard material, this is our integrated field effect transistor. That's the liquid, that's the, an oxide, you can get down way below 100 nanometers. Okay, so this is just sample preparation. In fact, that was the bottleneck of why nobody can uh, image uh, these liquid solid interfaces at high resolution. So once you figure this out, you can put in the TEM uh, or cryo TEM, and you right away see our two types of dendrites. That was the large one, this was the smaller one. You see how it winds through the uh, electrolyte. Remember that as it winds, we are cutting at a random cross-section, and so 
Sometimes you don't see the continuation, but it's because it's out of the point. Down at the bottom is the lithium electrode, and so we are interested both at this interface, but also what happens around the dendrite, uh, uh, which is an important problem, uh, and it's the formation of this uh, solid uh, electrolyte interface. Um, and so what we observe is actually for the first time is a very, very extended SEI layer. And the reason why that has, pre we believe it hasn't been previously observed is usual techniques to study them uh, involve washing of the, uh, of the battery. And that means any soft materials that are around your electrolyte will be washed away, you lose. Um, and so here we can look at the elemental distribution but not only at the elemental distribution, but also how the bonding varies, varies as you go across this uh, 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 um, SEI layer. So dendrite 2 looks dramatically different. You see that it has only a very, very thin oxygen-rich uh, uh, SEI layer at the surface, much more what you would actually usually expect the size of an SEI layer should be. Okay, so. Now the question is why are they distinct not only in structure but also in the SEI layer and that uh, EOS tells us. So here we have looked, so in red is the lithium KH measured on the dendrite type one. That was the larger one. Uh, in green is the dendrite type two. You see that the fine structure dramatically changes when you go from one dendrite to the other. And how can you tell what it is? You can compare it to uh, reference uh, spectra or reference spectra that you record under the same conditions, and that's what we have done. And you find that the dendrite type one is mostly lithium metal with a little bit of oxide, but lithium, uh, the, the second dendrite is actually a total surprise, which has not been uh, ex uh, uh, has not been observed in large quantities as, as such as these. Is lithium hydride? So two dendrites form. One is lithium metal. One is lithium hydride. And that's confirmed also in the oxygen cage uh, where there's no oxygen uh, for lithium hydride. Um, what we can also do, you can use the low loss region, which is basically where the optical transition occur, to map, uh, map um, the plasmon peaks of, uh, your, two uh, your, of your two dendrites. Uh, by the way, green is lithium hydride. You notice a peak at about 13. That's hydrogen, right? Uh, so that's lithium hydride, hydrogen peak, and then we have ten, uh, lithium for dendrite one and then uh, the electrolyte. And so what you see actually is the type two dendrite has a little lithium tip from which we uh, suspect that growth happens uh, from the root. So you first form a lithium cluster and then uh, the lithium hydride forms and pushes the rest up. So that's what we believe the growth mechanism is. Uh, and uh, lithium hydride, because of that small footprint at the uh, electrode, electrolyte interface, this can break off and therefore be lost to cycling. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, cryo stem is useful to look at electronic states and in particular look at structural order parameters and that it can also be very beneficial to look at phenomena in liquids. Uh, not only for biology, but also especially for, uh, for energy applications. Uh, it is also, and I, have not, I haven't had time to go through this, it's also really useful for things like reducing vapor pressure if you want to use, so, uh, if you want to measure sulfur in the microscope, it sublimates. You put a piece of sulfur in, it goes away. Can't trust anything that has pure sulfur in the material in the PM. So when you cool, you go be, uh, below that uh, uh, temperature. Uh, it reduces beam damage, and that's uh, really good for coughs, moths, uh, um, uh, organic uh, materials. It also reduces contamination, and so uh, unfortunately today, uh, p you know, our collaborators making nanoparticles, sometimes they can't get them clean enough for us. If you cool it down, you can give us bad samples, and we can actually produce high resolution results. So this is actually a big deal, even though it seems very small and mundane to you. Uh, by the way, what that, what that just means is the hard work on the materials uh, folks that make the sample is now shifted to us because we have to measure really hard uh, low temperature uh, data. Okay, so applications here, uh, as I mentioned, energy materials, sulfur, uh, electrolytes, and then 2D materials because when you cool, uh, you avoid agglomeration or movement of at atoms to grain boundaries that are very reactive and you can actually image those. 
So with that, I'm going to show you a picture of our cryo group. And the most, uh, and really want to thank the people that have done the work, uh, my students. And I want to highlight three. This is Ben, uh, Ismail, and David. They have done the work on uh, the oxides uh, and uh, the charge density wave systems. Barrett has done the work on low temperature, low temperature spectroscopy. And, uh, so here's a story for the grad students. Uh, uh, Michael joined me within a 10, I think, 10 minute discussion on batteries. He was convinced it was a good idea. It took him three years to get this to work. It was very hard. He gets all the credit for this one, so I'm very proud of him. Uh, and then nothing could be possible without collaborators, and they, uh, sorry, and they are really excellent. We have lots at Cornell. Uh, on the battery side, Lynn Archer did all the work on the lithium batteries. Um, uh, Daryl Schlom on oxides, uh, Harold Wong on oxides. Jochen Mannert on those crazy field effect transistors with liquids. Um, and then Songwook at Rutgers doing all the manganite work. Ramesh, I showed you some examples from Ramesh. And with that, I want to take questions. Thank you. There are questions? Is it possible to see uh, fast dynamics with these things? Yeah, yeah. How fast? <laughs> yes. How fast? <laughs> yes. Yes? Uh, no. <laughs> so, so ultra fast dynamics, you would have to go to, uh, well, OK, so the question is, so what resolution do you need? How fast? So what, what's the tr what is the kind of trade-off? So that, so that I can't answer either. And the trade-off is between resolution and, 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 and uh, uh, time resolution. So, Relatively decent uh, spatial resolution would give you may maybe um, picoseconds or more. But what we are doing as part of CVB, the Cornell Bright Beams, which you guys have heard of, is setting up an ultra fast diffraction setup. And lots of people are, uh, have demonstrated this, where you can actually look at very, very fa much faster time scale. So the goal would be to go to get to uh, sufficiently fast time scale, you can look at structural responses. So there has been work on tantalum disulfide looking at uh, charge uh, relaxation versus st uh, structural relaxation, looking at the Bragg spots, exactly with super lattice and the Bragg, Bragg profile. So can you, can you pop back on this the same two points and measure correlated motion? You can measure it, uh, you mean, you can measure it at the same time because you record the diffraction pattern and you just measure it as a function of time. And then you, ex yeah, you can plot a measurement. So the work was done by, um, in Germany by uh, Dwayne Miller. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a three times input of some compare O2 signal to that right signal, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so this is again with Linden Archer. So the, the the proposal is to actually avoid formation of hydrogen. Uh, and most hydrogen actually ha contain that. But one idea that he proposed, and there's some, some suggestions in literature already that that's useful, replacing hydrogen compounds with fluorinated compounds. And that actually has improved cyclability of the, uh, of the battery. So certainly there are ideas of how to improve it, and we're working on that. But I think the key is avoiding hydrogen right now. Yeah, I mean, so so uh, depends on which direction you want to go. So certainly what I'm interested in is uh, being able to, I'm right now excited about these phase transitions, and I know this is very basic uh, physics questions, but being able to, to actually controllably tune through phase transitions, uh, which we cannot do right now, we measure at two temperatures, being able to go to low temperature. So that will open up a bigger phase space of understanding electronic phases in general, uh, but also skirmions and so on and so forth. Uh, second one is dynamic events. So there's also a lot of, for example, if you make brighter beams, you can Im envision improving time resolution, but also spatial resolution, re reducing the, the uh, trade-off between the two. Uh, there is a lot of development in, um, doing more functional imaging. So imagine, instead of just measuring 
the local atomic position, you can also measure electric and magnetic fields. There's development, and I didn't talk about this because a lot of that work is driven by David Muller at Cornell, who's using a new type of, uh, type of detector to actually extract this quantitatively. And so now imagine you can measure local structure, electric and magnetic field, that would be very powerful. So I think functional imaging, certainly for me, low temperature uh, and dynamics, I think, are key. So there are lots more, but <laughs> just I think it'll keep us busy for a while. It's kind of intrigued by one of the earlier images, how you were able to use kind of the polarization to detect the, yeah. the built up charge. And I was wondering, can you tell between kind of a um, trap charge versus no. mobile? Yeah, no. Yeah, that, that uh, yeah, we cannot. We cannot. And that's an issue. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how to do it. So I think what you would probably want to do is you want to couple it with in situ. Uh, electrical measurements, which we can do, but we haven't started. Uh, but yeah, from spectroscopy, that's hard at this point, yeah. Can you, sorry, one question. Uh, you, you mentioned the word height, that there are parts of the and Oh, are you getting a cry microphone? You already have them, I know. But well, Yeah, so, so, uh, so the technique is single particle electron microscopy. Now, all of you who know what that is, is you take 100,000 particles and you average over them. So the reason why you can't do what I'm doing on oxides is because uh, in hydrated samples, you're totally dominated by uh, radiation damage, interaction of the beam with the sample. So in order to avoid that and get to enough counting statistics, you have to average over many, many, many identical molecules. Uh, and that is certainly really great. Uh, what's even nicer uh, right now is that there are approaches where you can take an ensemble of 100,000 particles and actually look at small variations in that statistical set of uh, molecules and figure out uh, the energetic landscape of how proteins deform and change, conformational changes. So that is really nice. I think that's the next big step. But for me, first of all, I'm, I do work on biology. In fact, I do a lot of biology as well, which I haven't talked about. But uh, um, the issue is that you need to take, this, the, take the molecule out of the cellular context. And for me, that does not make sense. So I would like to be able to actually measure uh, molecules inside the cell. And that will require much, much different approaches. And so some of the approaches are related. And in fact, that's where I picked up the technique is taking small thin slices through a cell using the same cryo technique um, to look at macromolecules in the cellular context. Uh, and the second approach is using actually the detector that I talked about to do a much more efficient way of collecting electrons in STEM mode and then hopefully being able to measure macromolecules inside the cell. So that is my approach avoiding going through um, single particle and because I think all they're gonna do is, I think right now it's time to harvest it's really great for the biologists who want to solve structure. It's not interesting for people that want to push the limits because I think it's not a soft problem, but it's, it's more things they're going to push down on, on the mass of the molecule that they can resolve, but that's it, I think. I think the new frontiers are in internal structures. It's my, my, <laughs> my five cents. And the, sorry, if I can say one more thing to cryo. So we're getting a new cry instrument and uh, there's a lot of investment from the university, it's all great. The problem is that X-ray crystallographers are the ones that are creating, any X-ray crystallographer? Okay, any, any cry EM people on, in the bio slide? All right, good. So, um, so the problem with this is really that, uh, so there's so, so many people in structural biology that wanna harvest right now these structures. The problem is that the crystallographers think it's very straightforward to do what, what electron microscopy does. And the answer is it is not. It's a huge learning curve. And what we're gonna struggle with as a community is they are selling cryos, uh, you know, these cryo instruments all over the world. I mean, they, they can't even keep up with the demand right now. They are seven to $10 million because biologists pay that amount, right? Uh, the problem is we don't have people to operate them. And it's gonna take a huge amount of effort to actually train people. So I'm just a little bit, I think it's great and people should do it, but uh, you just take it with a grain of salt because it's hard. It's really hard. It's, it's going to take you a while. Okay. Thank you. Well, 
we'll thank Lena again.